Welcome to the Measuring World Language Proficiency webinar series. Our first broadcast is on credentialing today. And this series looks at how to use different assessment measures and data in the classroom to evaluate language proficiency, including formative and summative assessment, and as I noted, credentialing, like the Global Languages Endorsement, North Carolina Seal of Biliteracy, which will be the focus of today's broadcast. Here is the agenda for today. As you can see, we're going to start with a welcome and overview. We're going to talk a little bit about credentialing and education in general. And then we're going to specifically look at measuring world language proficiency with North Carolina's seal of biliteracy, the Global Languages Endorsement. We'll finish up with questions and a few reminders and resources for you to use in your classroom. On the right-hand side of the screen, I actually have a picture of our seal of biliteracy, our Global Languages Endorsement. That's exactly what it looks like when you put it on a student's diploma. And I also have my picture and title. Uh, because I want to follow best practices, of course, when we do something online, so that you see a picture of me and you know who the voice um, behind this is. So let's begin with the definition of credentialing. I got this definition, as you can see, from an app, dictionary.com. And we look at credentialing, as we always do with language folks, as different parts of speech. So credential is simply and evidence of authority, status, rights, or the like, usually in a written form, or anything that provides the basis for confidence, belief, credit, or etc. From a verb standpoint, or the action, credential or credentialing or credentialed, means to grant credentials to, especially edu educational and professional ones, such as when someone says, she has been credentialed to teach math. That seems pretty basic, but it's actually something that we encounter and use quite a bit in education even when we may not realize it. So let's think about that for a moment. Here's our poll question about credentialing and education. What types of cred credentialing and education do you know about? And this may be personal knowledge because you have these kind of credentials, or it may be uh, knowledge just in general about this because you know of, of people, colleagues perhaps, who have these credentials. So as we noted before, I'm going to go ahead and launch this question. This is a poll question. So when I launch it, you can check all that apply to the question. What types of credentialing and education do you know about? Go ahead and click your answers on the screen, and then we'll discuss. Let's take about 10 seconds and finish up our voting. All right, thank you for voting. We can go ahead and close our poll and then share the results with you. All right, it looks like almost everyone on the line today knows about certifications, degrees, and of course licenses and endorsements. Not surprising given that we're a group of educators. Also, just a little less than half of you know about badges or badging as credentialing, and about 10% know about designations. So that's interesting to know. Let's go ahead and walk through a little bit of explanation about that and some examples of each. All right, let's start with badges, which, like I said, about half of you know about. Badges are a way to show what educators have done in earning things like, let's say, contact hours towards a CEU, or in their professional development work in general towards some goal. One example in North Carolina for NC is our Global Educator Digital Badge, or GEDB as we call it. The Global Educator Digital Badge has been available for several years now and is a process by which teachers can show their understanding and application of global education concepts within their classroom. We'll talk a little bit more in detail about how the Global Educator Digital Badge has rolled out in North Carolina and how it continues to be a credential that our educators can earn. 
Also, we have a number of certifications in education. One example, a national example for the U.S., is National Board Certification. I know some of you are very familiar with that because I've seen signatures on emails that include um, National Board Certification once it's been earned. And I know that you're probably aware that it's a fairly intense process where you um, put together a portfolio and someone evaluates the things that you do in your classroom and that you, you know and, and do as an established teacher. If you want more information about National Board Certification, there are a number of resources here in North Carolina. And I'm proud to say that North Carolina has a very large percentage of teachers who do have National Board Certification, especially as compared to other states. In world languages, that's sometimes a question for us because you can earn National Board Certification in two world languages. Um, although we currently teach 18 different ones in North Carolina. So that's sort of a challenge. And um, over time, they have done um, other attempts at National Board Certification in various languages. But right now, they have just the two languages, Spanish and French. Some of our world language teachers, however, can earn their National Board Certification in the grade span that they teach in as an elementary teacher, a middle school teacher, or a high school teacher. So there are other options for world language teachers to become nationally board certified, even if it isn't as uh, the, their particular world language focus. We also have, of course, and we're very familiar with the concept of credentialing through various degrees that you would earn. Obviously, most of us have. Um, an undergraduate degree, either a BA, a Bachelor of Arts, or a BS, a Bachelor of Science. Some of us have graduate or advanced degrees, maybe a master's degree like an MA or MS, or a doctoral level degree, an EDD or a PhD. And we even have some educators who have professional degrees like JD, the Juris Doctor, which is a law degree to practice law. So that's a little bit about credentialing and education. I promised you I'd share a little bit about our Global Educator Digital Badge. So that's what's up on the screen here. The Global Educator Digital Badge policy went into effect uh, in 2014 and expanded in 2015. So again, relatively new for us here in North Carolina. There are three requirements for this two-year process. Um, teachers or educators who are earning this have to come up with a professional development or PD plan with global elements to it aligned to our um, educator evaluation system here in North Carolina. They have to do 100 hours of professional development, which is quite a bit, which is exactly why there's a, it's a two-year process. And then they have to do a capstone project. So you can see for each year that this has been available, the number of districts that had teachers or educators participating, um, the number of educators actually enrolled, and the number who completed. Of course, we didn't have any completers until the second year. And you can see that in 2018, um, we have 100, over 100 teachers enrolled, and 26 have completed that so far. In the notes of this slide, um, and in many of the slides in this presentation, I have additional things. So we have links to, for example, the Global Educator Digital Badge page on the Global Education Wiki, in case you want more information about the Digital Badge. Um, and I also have information about some of our world language colleagues who've already earned the Digital Badge, because their capstone project is then available um, in home base so that all of us can access it and use that information. All right, so let's move back to our other kinds of credentialing and education that we talked about. Some of these um, you are more familiar with and some less familiar. Um, I'll start with the licenses and endorsements for educators or students. Um, most people are very familiar with this idea because, of course, all of us have a teaching license. Um, some of us also have an administrator license or an add-on um, to our, our teaching license as an administrator. We also can get add-ons to our teaching license to teach additional subjects. And I know some of us are duly certified in, in various languages and even in other subject areas. We also have diploma endorsements available to our high school graduates here in North Carolina. There are five diploma endorsements available, and of course we're going to talk about one, the Global Languages Endorsement today, in a very specific way, but there are others as well. Uh, for the designations, which is the ones that people had the least familiarity with it, um, designations are for educational organizations, um, in North Carolina at least, and the two that probably you hear most about, because they're the most recent and the most applicable to what we do in World Languages, are the Global Ready School designation and the Global Ready District designation. The Global Ready School designation has been earned by the schools you see on the left-hand side of the screen. 
The Global Ready designations in general are part of the North Carolina State Board of Education's Task Force on Global Education work. The focus of this was to assess the state's efforts to produce globally competitive graduates ready to live, work, and contribute in an interconnected world. And in doing that, they thought one way to highlight that and to really help people focus on those initiatives was to create opportunities for our schools and districts to earn recognitions in some way for the work they're doing with global education. The Global Ready designations do involve K-12 world language opportunities for all students. Um, they also have pathways for teachers, leaders, and administrators to achieve uh, that recognized badging, the Global Educator Digital Badge. They have career ready employer requirements, global school partnerships, and local board, school board resolutions and plans on global education. The Global Ready uh, School designation, the Global Ready District designation, both have rubrics that schools have to complete and submit for consideration. Um, and again, in the slides, there's a multiple details about that and links to information if you want more details to share at your school or district. We do also have two Global Ready districts so far in North Carolina. You see those on the right hand of the screen. All right, so that's credentialing and education, but now let's move on to measuring world language proficiency with credentialing in North Carolina specifically. So I want you to stop and think for a moment what you know about uh, licensing and the designations and the endorsements and answer this question. Which of these credentials require measuring world language proficiency in order to obtain them? Take a look and once again this is a check all that apply. So I'm going to go ahead and open this poll question and launch it for your consideration. I see people are giving this some thought before they're answering, and that's good. I have put our actual inverted pyramid of proficiency on the right-hand side of the screen because that is, of course, how we measure world language proficiency in this country, and certainly in this state within our state standards um, and in implementing our state standards in our classrooms. When we talk about measuring world language proficiency, this is also the proficiency scale we're referring to as the actual one. All right, let's go ahead and finish up voting. We're going to have a little more discussion on this, but also know if you want more information about the actual proficiency scale. Of course, there's um, details in our state standards documents and other support materials, but I've also linked this um, slide and put in the notes the uh, link to the actual proficiency guidelines 2012 webpage that has details about the proficiency pyramid and all the different levels. One thing that you likely already know is that in our state standards, we have proficiency outcomes based on this proficiency scale that go from novice low through advanced mid. All right, let's go ahead and close out our voting for now and see what you thought. Let me just share real quick what our results are. It looks like most of you believe that you need to measure world language proficiency in order to get credentialed as a teacher to get your teaching license, and that is true, as well as measure proficiency to earn a the Global Languages High School Diploma Endorsement, and that is also true. There's some caveats with the designations, so let's take a look at how that works and what we really mean when we say measuring world language proficiency for credentials. As we said, to get a credential like a teaching license, we definitely have to measure world language proficiency. In North Carolina, and in most other states that do this uh, this way, advanced low is the minimum proficiency level required for world language teacher licensing. And that's important to note, especially when we look at our actual proficiency uh, pyramid, 
and see where advanced low is, but know that that's just the minimum. And certainly we have teachers who have advanced mid, advanced high, superior, or even distinguished levels of proficiency in the language that they teach. One thing to note, and I do have this information in the notes of the slide, is that if you want more information about world language teacher licensing and things like the tests that are used to measure world language proficiency for licensing, you can go to the North Carolina State Board of Education licensure policies in the policy manual. And specifically, there are three policies about general licensure requirements, routes to licensure, and licensure testing requirements, including cut scores or required scores for language proficiency to get your world language teacher license. Also, when we have a student earning the Global Languages High School Diploma Endorsement, our state seal of biliteracy, they have to measure their world language proficiency and it has to be a minimum intermediate low. So take a look again at the proficiency pyramid to see where intermediate low is. I know that's a minimum because again, we might have students who have built their proficiency in a language or multiple languages uh, beyond intermediate low and inter intermediate mid, intermediate high, advanced low or advanced mid, certainly based on our standards, but also other things. All right. Now, some of you had indicated that you thought measuring world language proficiency was required to get our designations, either the Global Ready School designation or the Global Ready District designation. Actually, it's not required. They in the plans to get that, so in the rubrics for those designations, the schools or districts have to show that they're offering leading edge language instruction or offering language instruction to all students, as well as planning for authentic assessment of language proficiency and global competence, which might include measuring world language proficiency in the same way we're about to talk about the global languages endorsement, or might include other things as well. So it's not required in those designations, but it is something that is noted and that, that schools and districts can include in their plan uh, for the rubric. I'm going to stop for a minute. Um, we've got a question here on world language teacher licensing that's important. Uh, this person said, has it changed that some North Carolina teachers can be certified in languages through just the Praxis testing? Well, actually, um, the advanced low proficiency requirement is true for all world language teacher licensing whether a teacher is using the Praxis II exams in the language or ACTFL's OPI and WPT or Oral Proficiency Interview Written Proficiency Test as their exam to measure proficiency. Several years ago, um, we took a close look at world language teacher licensing, especially in relation to proficiency and the proficiency scales that we're using across the country. We determined that those teachers who can take a Praxis II exam and that's only in about four different languages, um, that their cut scores for those Praxis II exams were already at the advanced low level that they needed to be certified. But then we also added the actual OPI and WPT exams for languages that did not have a Praxis II exam. So again, all teachers could be licensed in the language that they wanted to teach. Um, and what that also meant was that if both a Praxis II exam exists and the actual OPI and WPT in that language, then the teacher candidate would have their choice of the test that they wanted to take. That is all covered, by the way, in the um, State Board of Education policy related to licensure, and specifically the licensure testing requirements policy. So that's spelled out quite clearly in there if you want to take a look at that. Okay, so what we're here to talk about today, of course, in very uh, serious detail, is our Global Languages Endorsement. So let's take a look one more time at the intermediate low minimum requirement to earn the Global Languages High School Diploma Endorsement, and then let's get into some details about that policy and how students earn that. Our Global Languages Endorsement is, of course, our seal of biliteracy. The Seal of Biliteracy is a national movement, as we'll discuss closer to the end of our broadcast today, but I always want to use those two because they are synonymous. Our Global Languages Endorsement is our Seal of Biliteracy. You see on the right-hand side the brochure for our Seal of Biliteracy. If you click on that, of course, you can um, go right to that and download it, but it's also a handout in today's webinar. If you go to your control panel, you'll see that there's the GLE brochure, because we love to use our acronyms instead of spelling everything out document names. So I would encourage you to go to 
the um, handouts part of your control panel right now and go ahead and open up that brochure so that you can be looking at on your own screen if you would like. You'll find several details on the brochure. First of all, the um, seal of biliteracy was approved by the NCSBE, or North Carolina State Board of Education, in January 2015. That means it's relatively new. It also means it was available beginning with the class of 2015. So we are actually one of the states that's had a seal of biliteracy for several years now. As I mentioned earlier, our Global Languages Endorsement is one of five high school diploma endorsements a student can earn as outlined in State Board of Education Policy Grad 007. And I put those specific policy references there for you and I've linked them in the notes. So if you want more details about the other four uh, high school diploma endorsements or this fifth one, the Global Languages Endorsement, you can certainly go to the specific policy and read through that. The purpose of our Global Languages Endorsement is to provide a way for students to show their multiliteracy in English and at least one world language. It looks like English got hidden under the brochure. But it is important when we say Global Languages Endorsement that languages is plural and that we specifically mean English as well as at least one other world language. Note that students can have multiple world languages for which they qualify depending on their background and um, the paths that they choose or the options they choose to show their proficiency. The endorsement seal is on the diploma. It very much is a sticker, if you will, or a seal that you put on the diploma. And it is also noted on the student's transcript with the world languages that they've qualified in and the proficiency levels of those languages that they've qualified at. So there's a lot of information there and a recognition of what students have been able to do with language. So let's take a very close look at the policy requirements for the Global Languages Endorsement, our state's seal of biliteracy. First and foremost, before we get into the world language component of this, I want to point out to you the English requirements for it. We are one of several states that has a very comprehensive policy and recognizes um, all languages, including English, as necessary to have proficiency in. So the first requirement, that first bullet is, says that students have to meet the high school English language arts requirements by earning an unweighted 2.5 GPA or higher in their required four English courses. Those of you, of course, who to work in high schools are probably very familiar with the fact that students have four required English language arts or ELA courses, we sometimes call them. So that's part of meeting this policy requirement is to make sure you've taken those courses as a student and earned at least a 2.5 GPA or higher in those courses. Also, the last bullet pertains to our English learner students, and we see many of our English learner students in our world language classroom because they are learning um, their home language or their heritage language, but we also sometimes see them there because they're taking another language as well. However, when it comes to their English proficiency, the policy is quite clear that English learner students need to complete the English language arts component and world language requirements that we're going to um, look at from above, but they all must also reach what's called developing level proficiency per the proficiency scale in the four domains on the most recent state identified English language proficiency test. So those four domains are reading, writing, speaking, and listening, just like we have in all language learning. But they do have a specific um, assessment that's done, and so they have to reach developing on that for their English language skills. Um, as well as completing the English language arts requirements. So those are the, the English requirements. Now let's look at the middle bullet and all of its options there about establishing proficiency in a world language. For our seal of biliteracy, the world language proficiency requirement is intermediate low, as we said before, sometimes abbreviated IL. When a student goes to establish their proficiency in a world language for our seal of biliteracy, they must complete one of these three options you see here. They do not have to complete them all, but they must complete one. So let's focus in on each one of these. The first one I want us to look at is the one that's the most common option that students take. This is completing four levels of the same language with an unweighted 2.5 GPA or higher. Obviously, this is very similar to the English language arts requirement. And as I said, it's the most common option that, that we see in the data. When a student earns their world language proficiency requirement through this uh, option, 
it will be noted on this transcript as intermediate low. And that has to do with the fact that our proficiency outcomes in our state standards for courses uh, at the high school level, high school credit courses, have proficiency outcomes. And we look specifically at usually the level four course, which is intermediate low. Although if students complete additional courses, like a level five course, level six, level seven, or level eight, they can also complete the requirements, but their proficiency level will still be at intermediate low if this is the option they choose to show their world language proficiency. The next most common option that students choose is the one about taking an external exam. And this is where external exams that are proficiency based and again match up to our state standards with those proficiency outcomes are assembled on a list and we call it our NCDPI approved external assessment list. A student can take an exam that's listed on there for the language that they want to earn their world language proficiency recognition in and they have to achieve a minimum language proficiency score of IL or intermediate low just like you would expect. On this particular option, however, because we have chosen proficiency-based exams that look at the range of skills and also um, go higher than intermediate low, when a student takes this option and they've taken this external exam, it's noted on their transcript with the level of the test score, the proficiency level of the test score. So it might be that their test score shows they got intermediate low, and again, it would still be noted on the transcript as intermediate low with whatever language it was. Or they might have gotten a bit higher at intermediate mid or IM, intermediate high or IH, advanced low of AL, or advanced mid of AM. So it depends on their test score, and this test score must be entered into the system. All right. Finally, the, the other option the students can follow to earn their uh, Global Languages endorsement is use the Credit by Demonstrated Master CDM policy to establish intermediate low proficiency. And as we've noted before, since we have proficiency outcomes that go with every course in our standard course of study for world languages, um, and certainly with high school credit courses, um, they follow this CDM policy where they have a phase one of a test and a phase two of an artifact. And if they do that for a level of, of course that a CDM, then that's noted on their transcript as well. So let's say you have a student come in and they want to show that they have mastered all the content for a level three course. They would have to follow this um, and with a level three of course it wouldn't yet be at intermediate low proficiency but they might continue their language study and get higher. But they could do CDM um, for any level course and use that as part of their um, global languages endorsement if they would like. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this because I see questions popping up and we want to answer those. A couple things I want to address. We've got one person who says, so as long as a student takes and gets at least a 2.5 GPA in English for four years and they take a world language for four years, they can receive this endorsement. Well, yes, pretty much, and let's go back and, and talk a little bit about that. As I said, the most common option that students choose is completing four levels of the same language with an unweighted 2.5 GPA or higher, which is very much very similar to the English language arts requirement that's the first bullet. Keep in mind, though, what the system is going to look for is that someone has completed at least a level four because when we look at our state standards at proficiency outcomes, level four courses in any language, whether it's an alphabetic language, a logographic language, or a visual language, the proficiency outcomes aren't at intermediate low proficiency until level four. But they can do that. And again, as long as they meet the GPA requirements and it's an unweighted GPA, they could earn this global languages endorsement. Now another question I see is, having to do with our next one, where can I access the NCDPI exam? Well, there actually is no NCDPI exam. What there are is a list of exams that are proficiency-based from external vendors, because remember this is an external exam, but there's a list of NCDPI approved external world language assessments, and this list is actually linked to this document here. It's posted and available on the Global Languages Endorsement page of the Global Education Wiki, and this information is also in the notes. Let's take a look at it, though, because when we talk about those external exams, I want us to really understand what's available there and what's not, and I also want us to, to think about 
when the student gets a test score, if they're taking this external exam option, what that test score would equate to for a proficiency level because it may be different than intermediate low. It just depends. Hang on just a second. Let me go ahead and click on the link that I know I put into to our list of NCDPI approved external world language assessments. So this is an overview of this and this by the way is a Google document that you go to because sometimes we have um, external exams that get added. The external exams on here as I noted are all proficiency based. We have had other exams suggested to us as a state that were achievement based or grammar based and those are not here because in order to earn the global languages endorsement you must show proficiency in the language so you must have a test that is proficiency based. I'm going to scroll down um, so you can take a look at what's here. Notice we have the name of the, the external exam, the languages, the report that you'll see like the raw score report and what it'll have on it, and what you would have to enter into PowerSchool so that it appeared on the transcript correctly. Now clearly ACTFL has the OPI and WPT. We were just talking about that one um, with teacher licensing. Obviously for teacher licensing the proficiency is higher, but the OPI and WPT can be used for this. And most recently, in fact, just last month, um, ACTFL announced that they are having uh, a K-12 bundle that's an OPI and WPT, and they're offering it many languages that are heritage languages here in North Carolina, but are not um, commonly taught or not taught at all in our schools. You can see that list on the screen, and feel free to make it bigger if you would like it. Um, but that's the kind of options that are available. Clearly on an actual test, because it uses the actual proficiency scale, the raw score report would have the same proficiency levels. However, if you scroll, start to scroll down, you'll see that there are other exams as well that, again, these are external exams from different vendors, and they are proficiency-based. So we have the APPLE exam, um, which stands for Assessment Performance Toward Proficiency in Languages. It's through the testing branch of ACTFL. Um, it is available in a variety of languages and, and more um, this year than last. And you can see that the score reports come out a little bit uh, different, but we have equated those to the proficiency levels and then on the right-hand side, what proficiency level you would enter into PowerSchool if you use these exams. The ALIRA exam is for Latin. It's the same kind of thing as the APPLE exam, but it's specifically for Latin. And then, of course, we've got something like the AP exams and Cambridge exams, which most of us are familiar with. With the AP exams, of course, they're available in seven languages, and you can see that a score of three equates to intermediate low, but a score of four is intermediate mid, or a score of five is advanced low. So that's something to keep in mind, especially for programs that offer AP exams to students. One thing you'll notice is that the external uh, vendor uh, who offers that is highlighted, that means it's hyperlinked, so if you want information or your students want information about these particular exams, you can click right out to their websites and get those details that you need to. And I'll just scroll down through the rest of the document. You can see there's different kinds of external exams here. All of them have to be full um, analyses of proficiency in the language in order to be listened, listed here. So want to make sure they're testing a variety of skills, just like we said with the English learners, the reading, writing, speaking, and listening components of a language. Um, and you can see again that there's, there's a variety here. I hope that helps with the question about the external exams and finding out about them. One question that has also come up is where can a teacher access the questions on one of these external exams? Well, if you want to know how those exams work and how they're set up, first you have to think about the fact that they're proficiency based, so they're going to be having a student produce language in a variety of ways or receive language and react to that so they can uh, assess their proficiency. And that's the exact same kind of thing we do in our proficiency-based classrooms. But also, if you want more information about it or if you want example questions for, uh, to use with your students, you can go out to that list of external exams and click on the um, links to more details about those exams. All right, we've got some other questions here. I just want to pause for a moment and address those as we need to. Um, one question says, do there exist any badges for teachers who seek training to administer these exams? It's a really good question. 
I'm going to go back to our list of external exams. I'm going to scroll a bit, so sorry about if that makes anyone dizzy. Um, are the testing companies that are listed here, you're welcome to contact them as a teacher to see if they need people to be, for example, readers or scorers on those e the exams. I can tell you um, just offhand that with the Apple exam through ACTFL, there is a way to train to be an Apple Rater where you would receive um, tests and so forth the students have done online and you would rate those samples so that those test scores could be returned to the students. I believe that's an online training process, but you'd have to contact Act Actful to get more information. You could do that by clicking on that link where it says um, Apple. It will take you to their website and you can explore that. Also, as some of you probably already know, um, the AP is a good example of that. Um, periodically, we hear about them needing AP readers, and this is people to be trained, much like with the Apple or any other assessment, to score um, the AP exams, um, particularly the essay portions of the AP uh, World Language exams, and that's a process that I would encourage you to pursue if you're interested. Um, I don't know that they give badges for that, but certainly you get certified as a rater or a reviewer for exams and you can use that information to help you as a teacher and as just a language learner yourself. I'm sure some of the other external assessments, uh, external exams also have that kind of training. All right. Let's go ahead on. Now that we know a little bit more about how a student earns the seal of biliteracy or the global languages endorsement, Let's see if we could figure out if a student has been successful in that. So we're going to do some scenarios. So when we think about measuring world language proficiency, let's look at credentialing and for each scenario decide what your answer to the questions would be. I'm going to give you a scenario and I want you to ask yourself, does this student qualify for global languages endorsement or GLE on their diploma? And if yes, which languages and at which proficiency levels? And if no, what is the requirement that is not met, that they have not yet completed? Also note in all of these scenarios, the students have met the English language arts requirement of an unweighted 2.5 or higher GPA, so you don't need to worry about that component uh, as qualified. And when you've decided that, what I want you to do in the questions box is enter your answer starting with Y for yes or N for no, that they've qualified for the GLE on their diploma, and then include some details using abbreviations like for proficiency levels or tests as needed. All right, so if I know what we need to do, we're going to look at these scenarios and then you're going to get to decide. Here's scenario number one. The student completed Spanish 1, Spanish 2, Spanish 3, and Spanish 4. The unweighted GPA in Spanish courses is 3.75. So, does this student qualify for a GLA on their diploma? In the questions box, enter a Y if yes, and then say which languages and at which proficiency levels, or enter an N for no, and what is the requirement that is not met for the world languages. I'll pause and let you enter your answers in the questions box. All right, go ahead and enter your answers, Y for yes or N for no, and then the explanation.
All right, let's take a look. I see a lot of yeses in the questions box, and that is correct. Yes, this student has earned the Global Languages Endorsement, the GLE in Spanish, and intermediate low or IL proficiency would show on their transcript. As we noted before, completing a four-course sequence is the most common way that students meet the requirements for the Global Languages Endorsement. And of course, they've met their GPA requirement here too, because it's 2.5 or higher. They actually had a 3.75. I did have someone who was concerned there was an external assessment missing. And please note, again, students only have to complete one of the options. So they either complete a four course sequence, or they do an external assessment, or they do the CDM process. But they only have to do one. All right, here's the second scenario. A student participated in a G German dual language immersion program, K-8. In high school, they were placed in German 4 as a ninth grader and then took the AP German course during 10th grade. On the AP German test, they scored a 5. So, does this student qualify for a GLE on their diploma? Yes or no, and why? Go ahead and put your answers into the question box. All right, I'm getting a lot of yes answers. And that is correct. Yes, this student would have earned a GLE in German, showing AL or advanced low proficiency on the transcript if the AP test score of 5 was entered into power school. Remember on that external assessment list, we had a score of 3, 4, or 5 equated to um, the different proficiency levels. Now, if the test score was not entered for some reason, this student would still have earned a GLE in German, but showing only intermediate low proficiency based on the course completion, because it says they have completed German 4 as well as the AP German course. And so they would still have gotten it, but they wouldn't have gotten it as at the highest level they could have unless the, the AP test score had been entered. One thing PowerSchool does now that this is automated is it looks for the highest level of proficiency for the world language requirement on the Global Languages Endorsement. So when the system does a check, they go ahead and um, look at first the course completion, and if that's completed, then they know they're going to earn it in intermediate low proficiency. But if they have something like an external exam that would give them a higher level of proficiency for the Global Languages Endorsement, that is noted and it appears on the transcript that way. Okay, before we move on, um, one person asked, um, how did they earn this if they did not take German 1 through 3? Well, they actually did take what was in German 1 through 3, because remember, they went through a German dual language immersion program where they were learning content in German. So they were taking classes in math and science and social studies, but they were learning all that content in German. And as a result, when they got to high school, um, they were assessed and they were placed into German 4 to, as a ninth grader. So you don't have to take levels 1, 2, 3, and 4 for the four course sequence. You just have to get to level 4 or higher because of the way our state standards work with the proficiency outcomes. So we have a lot of students, by the way, um, who are in this situation. Maybe they've had some previous study in the language. Maybe they've even had something as extensive as a dual language immersion program. We have students who've lived all over the world and who may have gotten um, experience with a language and proficiency in a language in some other way prior to high school. So they don't always take the um, every single level. They, they start where they need to begin to continue to build their proficiency in the language. All right, let's move on to another scenario. This one's scenario number three. I'll let you read it quickly and then start putting your decisions in to the question box.
All right, we've got some mixed results on this one, and this one was a little more complicated. So we've got a student who completed Chinese 3, 4, and 5 um, after some previous experience with Chinese in middle school. They start with Chinese 3 as a ninth grader. Their GPA is 3.5. They also participate in a summer immersion program in Italy and got uh, took an external exam with a score of novice high proficiency. So most of you are spot on when you say this answer is yes and no. Yes, they have a global language endorsement in Chinese showing intermediate low proficiency on the transcript because they took the course sequence option to show that. But no to a GLE in Italian because novice high or NH proficiency is below the minimum needed for the global languages endorsement because our minimum, of course, is intermediate low. All right, I'm conscious of our time, but we're going to finish up quickly here. Let's take a look real quickly at this scenario four. This is a student who transfers into high school after living in Brazil and successfully completes the CDM process for other modern language seven, Portuguese, which is entered into power school. Also, the student is an English learner and they have received the score of developing on the WIDA test for English proficiency. Take a moment. What do you think? Has a student earned a GLE on their diploma? All right, I've seen a lot of mixed results on this one. So let's take a look. The answer to this question is yes, they have earned a GLE on their diploma. They'll have a GLE in Portuguese showing advanced low proficiency on the transcript because they were able to do the CDM process. And there is information on the Global Languages Endorsement Wiki page that talks about how each course um, is aligned for the CDM process to those proficiency outcomes in our state standards. So a level seven. Um, would be advanced low proficiency, and so they would get that. Um, one person had some questions um, on um, the developing level. Developing is the minimum needed on the WIDA test for English learners, and so that would have been fine with the English proficiency for the people who were asking about that. Some people are saying we let kids do CDM for Portuguese. A student can earn the Global Languages Endorsement and presumably do CDM, the credit by demonstrating mastery process as well, in any language um, that they need to. So we're going to talk about what languages it's been earned in here in a few minutes. Let's do our last scenario quickly because this is one that has come up quite frequently of late and I want to make sure we're clear on this one before we go on to some of our data. Scenario number five is a student takes French 1 and 2 at high school and then French 111 and 112 or elementary French courses at the community college as part of an early college program. The unweighted GPA is 4.0. So does this student qualify for a GLE on their diploma? Go ahead and take a look. Okay, I'm seeing mostly no's on this one, and that is correct. The answer here is no. French 1 and 2 at the high school correspond to French 111 and 112. So the student actually repeated the French courses they'd already taken at the high school when they got to the community college campus. So that means their proficiency level is only equivalent to what you would have after two courses in French, which is roughly novice mid proficiency, well below the intermediate low minimums needed here. If you want more information about this, I encourage you to look at our World Languages course codes for credit by demonstrated mastery proficiency levels, which is posted on the page where everything else with the Global Languages endorsement is. But also, we have a high school versus community college course sheet, or HS versus CC, if we abbreviate it, that kind of shows how high school credit World Language courses equate to those community college courses. And I'll just quickly click on that link so that you can see as it comes up, French 1 and 2, as we said, 
are the same as the elementary French 111 and 112 at community college. So this student, though they've taken four courses, took actually the same two courses and just repeated them. So they have not earned their GLE, unfortunately. All right. So just a quick reminder of our requirements here. I know we're getting short on time, and I appreciate if you can stay on the line. If not, these materials will be posted later. Well, let's go ahead and take a look at some of our data. So far, Global Languages Endorsements, or CELA by Literacy, have been earned in 13 languages in North Carolina. They're all up here on the screen. Notice we've got a good variety of uh, the languages that we have both taught in our schools as well as those that are heritage or home languages for some of our students. Please note on Persian and Swahili, those are not yet taught K-12. They're not one of our 18 languages that are taught in K-12 schools. But we have had students earn those, so likely they did that through the external exam process or the CDM process in their schools. Um, we also have a wide variety of other languages. We have American Sign Language, of course, um, as well as Latin. And this is interesting because some states, seals of biliteracy, um, aren't as flexible as ours. And they only allow things like um, certain external exams to be used, which limits the languages that are available. And so in North Carolina, I'm very happy to say that a student can study or be learning any language, whether it's a classical language like Latin, um, an alphabetic language like Arabic or French, um, a logographic language like Chinese or Japanese, or a visual language like American Sign Language, and can earn their Global Language Endorsement or a seal of biliteracy in the language that they're studying, so long as they meet the requirements. And again, the most popular option is completing level four or higher courses in the language. So let's take a quick look at our data. Um, in the first year, the class of 2015, that the Global Languages Endorsement was available, we had just over 1,500 students earn it. That was 1.7% of our graduates statewide. And we have graduates from high schools in 27 of our districts that year. The following year, we had more students, over 2,400, and it was 2.5% of our graduating class, and we had, again, 27 districts um, and now one charter school. Keep in mind, not all charter schools have high schools that have graduates. Some charter schools are only elementary or middle school. In the third year, the class of 2017, we were down a bit um, with only 1% uh, 1 of our graduates earning their Global Languages endorsement from 15 different districts. We suspect this was because up to this point, we had to enter our data manually in PowerSchool for the Global Languages Endorsement. That's because it was a new endorsement and the automated programming hadn't yet been put into PowerSchool, though it was in the plans. We had thought the automation would be in place by the class of 2017, but it was not. And we think we had some districts who were waiting for it, um, but it didn't happen that year. For the class of 2018, however, this process was automated. So you could run a, f a function in PowerSchool, and it would tell you uh, for your school, whether that's a school at a district or a charter school, how many graduates you had eligible for the Global Languages Endorsement um, and what they had done to complete that. And it would give you the opportunity to put in information about um, you know, if someone done an external exam or done the CDM process, but also would check automatically for the course sequence completion. Now we had over 9,000 students who had earned the Global Languages Endorsement, which is 9% of our graduating class that year. And notice we had 92 of 115 of our public school districts, as well as 32 of 70 charter schools. Now again, um, not all charter schools offer um, high school, but um, those that do, 70 of them, um, just under half had students earned that. Please also note there are actually 116 districts with the Innovative School District, but at this time only 115 have high schools. So this calculation is done based on districts that have had graduating classes, just like the charter schools. So take a look at that. Consider what that means for our students going forward and how this credentialing might work for them as they go into the workforce, into their careers, and into post-secondary education of all kinds. Oh, I see an important question that's come up. Um, one person said they know that their students haven't been earning this because they have not yet been offering four levels of language, but they are doing it this year. And they said, how do we know that our students will get this? Who is responsible for checking it? 
The person responsible for checking this at your school level is usually your school counselor or your data manager. So whoever your power school person is, your data manager, or whoever works most closely with that person for things like transcript questions is who you need to talk to to ask about this. Given our time, we're not going to do this next activity, but I encourage you to take a look at this and think about this. Um, one thing that, that teachers want to ask themselves is, how did your district or charter school do over the past four years with our seal of biliteracy, with the number of global language endorsement earners in languages? In the handout section of this control panel, I actually have um, handouts that are global languages endorsements by charter school and global languages endorsements by district. And you can take a look at that, and for each graduating class that's been eligible for GLE, you'll see the number of GLEs that were earned for your district or charter school. And then um, on the far right-hand side of that, you'll actually get to see um, what languages your global languages endorsements have been earned in so far from your district or charter school. And that is cumulative. I will tell you that our data keeps getting better and better each year with um, the Global Languages endorsement. And so it's becoming clearer and clearer uh, which languages um, the information is being earned in, as well as uh, a number of other details about which options students are choosing for the world language component of this. This information, too, is being made available as a handout today. Um, we are working towards making that available, publicly available in a Google spreadsheet when we transition to our new websites in January of 2019. All right, as we close out today, I just want to remind you that this kind of credentialing, our measuring world language proficiency, is happening not just in North Carolina, but across the U.S. Seals of biliteracy are available in over 30 states including our neighboring states. The states that appear on the map um, in kind of a darker blue are the ones that have an approved state seal. Um, within the southeast here, um, North Carolina was the first to have a seal of biliteracy. We've had one, as I noted before, since January 2015. Virginia was very soon after. Georgia came about a year later. And most recently, in this calendar year, Tennessee and South Carolina have joined that. So that's an exciting thing to think about for all of our students um, across the region. All right, I'm going to take one last look for questions, make sure we've gotten everything answered. I think we have. I would encourage you um, to look more closely at this information. Think about how your students are doing, how your school or district is doing with the Global Languages Endorsement, as well as the other diploma endorsements that recognize hard work from students as well as teachers in their programs. As we close out today, I just have a few reminders and resources that you may be interested in. First and foremost, I always want to share with you our recent professional development. We have several World Language webinar series, including the K-12 program showcase and the World Language quarterly update webinars. Some of you, I think, were here for the last uh, World Language quarterly update webinar, which was last Wednesday. Um, but we also had a K-12 program showcase on classical language programs like Latin on October 24th. All of our World Language Webinar Series broadcast materials are posted on the Webinar Series information page of the World Languages Wiki. So you can always get to that information if you want to look at it more closely or if you want to um, access it because you weren't able to attend the live broadcast. It's all there for you. Our World Language Webinar Series 2 has some upcoming things. I've um, grayed out the things that are already done. So as of today, we have done the first webinar in the Measuring World Language Proficiency Series. You see that in the new year, We'll have our um, third World Language Quarterly Update on January 30th. Um, we'll also have a K-12 program showcase on February 20th that will likely be focused on dual and heritage language programs. And then the next um, broadcast in this series will be on April 3rd. Also, don't forget about our upcoming conferences. We have the 7th International Conference on Immersion in Dual Language Education. Uh, this international conference is coming to Charlotte, North Carolina in February of 2019. You can get more information on their website. And then the Southern Conference on Language Teaching, or SCOLT Conference, will be on March 21st through the 23rd in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, FLANC, the Foreign Language Association of North Carolina, is one of three partners with SCOLT for this conference. So the SCOLT 2019 conference will actually also be our FLANC spring conference this year. 
Don't forget to sign up to the World Language Listservs. You can subscribe to DPI Listservs with the links there on the screen, um, as well as in the notes section. We do have four World Language Listservs for different um, stakeholders and educators in general. And then you can also sign up for other DPI Listservs, like ones for charter schools, global education, legislative updates, and so on. Finally, um, I always want to give you my information. You can contact me, your World Languages Consultant, uh, via phone or email with the information there. We also have an NCDPI World Languages Facebook page, so go on there and, and see what gets posted. Um, and as noted, everything is on the wiki for right now. Our webinar series information page will have all of our broadcast materials from today. And all of the content from our NCDPI wiki spaces will be moving to a new home with Google Sites by January of 2019. So that process is already underway and in the new year we'll have a brand new website for world languages. I'm going to go ahead and close out for today. I'm still here if you have questions though, but I want to thank you for joining us uh, today and sharing your answers and, and your thinking about our global languages endorsement and wish you a very good evening.